Welcome to this tutorial about MRAM workflow in Quantum ATK. We will be studying the free layer stability in a spin transfer talk MRAM. This involves setting up structures using the MRAM builder, taking it all the way to vampire spin dynamic simulations. The outline of the tutorial is the following. After a brief introduction to spin transfer talk MRAM, We'll start out the actual calculations by setting up the structure using a dedicated MRAM builder and relaxing the configuration using machine learned moment tensor potentials. The next step will be to calculate parameters for the spin Hamiltonian. This is done using the Heisenberg exchange and magnetic anisotropy energy objects. We end up by setting up vampire simulations and analyzing the results. A spin transfer talk MRAM is very schematically shown down here. There are two magnetic layers. The fixed layer, where the magnetization always points upwards, and the free layer, where the magnetization can be pointing either upwards or downwards. Depending on the magnetic configuration of the free layer, the resistance of this uh, junction changes and you are able to read whether it's a parallel or anti-parallel configuration. The reading is done using what is known as tunneling magnetic resistance defined like this. When you want to switch the magnetization of the free layer, a physical concept known as spin transfer torque, is used. Finally, it's important, of course, that this device is able to store the magnetic uh, state of the free layer and only be changed when you are writing. The storage is characterized by a stability factor, delta, which is the energy it takes for flipping the magnetization divided by KBT. Both the reading and writing processes can be studied in quantum ATK, but in this tutorial we're focusing on the storage and the stability factor. Now, a real STT MRAM structure is a lot more complicated than this. There are in fact multiple layers, both for the reference layer and for the free layer. We'll be focusing on the free layer here, where we have an iron or iron cobalt boron encapsulated between two magnesium oxide layers. This is where the magnetization can be switched and the energy it takes is called delta E. This is what we'll be studying. In order to calculate this, we'll be using atomistic spin dynamics simulations using the vampire code, which is integrated in quantum ATK. The starting point for spin dynamics simulations is the definition of the Hamiltonian. This consists of three terms here. The first term is the Heisenberg exchange which is characterized by the couplings here, and S, I, and S, J denotes the spin orientation on atom I and J. In the middle, we have an anisotropy term characterized by an anisotropy constant. And finally, we have a Seaman-like term, which is present if you apply a magnetic field. The parameters entering this Hamiltonian can all be calculated from quantum ACK, either from the Heisenberg exchange for the JIJ constants, and the anisotropy constant can be obtained using the magnetic anisotropy energy. For more references for using Vampire, we refer to the web page and these um, papers. In particular, for calculating the magnetic anisotropy energy, we refer 
to this paper about constraint Monte Carlo, which we'll be using later. We're now ready to start setting up the structure using the MRAM builder. As any other study in quantum ATK, we start out by defining the atomic structure. Usually that would happen in the builder, but in this case we have a dedicated tool that we call the MRAM builder that can be used. So I open this, and uh, now I want to add the different layers. So uh, I start out by adding a uh, thin magnesium oxide layer. I can vary the length here. This will be followed uh, by the magnetic layer. Here I could choose between either an alloy of iron and cobalt or pure iron. For this case, in order to keep it simple, I choose just pure iron and uh, with a target length of uh, 15 angstroms. Then we add another uh, magnesium oxide layer also of this thickness. Over here I can choose uh, which uh, layers I want to stretch and this can of course depend a bit on the experimental uh, conditions so uh, I will choose to uh, strain the uh, MGO layers in this case. Um, now the program is finding the different uh, interface uh, configurations and we can choose among those. In this case we have found a configuration here. It's uh, of this type here. We have the MGO in Ireland and MGO in the bottom. So I want to edit uh, one thing, so you notice that on the top layer the iron interfaces to a magnesium oxide. However, often it is uh, assumed that the iron faces oxygen, and this is at least what gives you the highest uh, anisotropy energy. So um, I will just add a small displacement to the top magnesium layer, like this. So now we have iron in direct contact with magnesium, or excuse me, with oxygen on both ends. Now we're ready to uh, run the relaxation. I could either send this uh, directly uh, to the job, but let's first have a look at the script using the editor. So in the script, the, uh, the different layers are defined. We have magnesium oxide, iron, and magnesium oxide again. And then we have the calculators defined. Using the MRAM builder, we're using a Tremolo X force field calculator, using a machine learned moment tensor potential dedicated in this case to iron and MGO. Now going back uh, to the MRAM builder, we see that we could also have added tantalum and tungsten as buffer layers or capping layers. We also have moment tensor potentials covering these elements. Now this can be sent to the job manager and run. This will only take about half a minute on a normal laptop. Um, and I can just run it locally and we will get the results in a second. So we can close the MRAM builder and look at the job manager which shows that the Optimization using MTP has been finished. We're going back to the data tool 
and uh, here we find the uh, the relaxed or optimized configuration that we can now uh, drag out drag on to the builder <coughs> so this is our structure we have the uh, four layers of MGO on either side and 11 layers of iron in the middle. I will just uh, rename the structure accordingly. Like, uh, like this. And uh, now we have done with the initial step of the structure generation. The next step in the workflow will be to calculate the parameters used for the spin Hamiltonian, which is the Heisenberg exchange and magnetic anisotropy. Going back to the builder, we will now send this configuration to the workflow builder. Here, I first attach an LCO calculator and set the spin type to polarized. Since we're dealing with uh, metallic systems for the iron, it's often a good idea to increase the K point sampling slightly above uh, default. Otherwise, I keep everything as default. Then I add a Heisenberg exchange object. I will open that and uh, only change that uh, since this is a slab, we will not need uh, repetitions in the C direction, so this I will set to 1. This exchange interaction range defines how many uh, neighbors we are including, and a value of 5 means that we are repeating the structure 5 times in A and B direction, and uh, only one time in the C. Uh, for the uh, K point sampling, I will use a, a, a density 7, except for the C direction where we can set it to 1, one K point. This uh, is enough for the Heisenberg exchange. The next uh, to calculate will be um, the magnetic anisotropy energy. This requires a calculator with spin orbit coupling, so I will add a new calculator and uh, change the spin type to non-collinear and again uh, increase uh, k-point sampling to 7 angstroms. Then I add a uh, magnetic anisotropy energy study object here. You can open it. Most of the uh, default values are good. Um, but uh, I will uh, increase the uh, the density slightly to actually 20, uh, 20 angstroms, uh, except for the C direction where we can go with just a single keeper. Oh, sorry. So uh, like this. Here we calculate the energy difference between angle of theta angle of 0 and uh, 90, whereas the phi angle is 0 in both cases. This is enough for now. So this is a somewhat larger calculation involving uh, uh, <coughs> DFT calculations, so we'll run this on a, on a cluster but it is not uh, a very heavy calculation. So uh, on a uh, machine with, uh, in this case, uh, 20 cores, uh, it takes about uh, half an hour. I will submit it uh, now, and we can uh, view the results a bit later. The calculation has now finished, and uh, looking at the log, we see that uh, it was done 
in about uh, 30 minutes. So now we can go back to the data tool and uh, I will be focusing on this uh, the results file, which is there. So now I have my Heisenberg exchange and magnetic anisotropy energy object. I can uh, try to open this uh, and here we get an atom projected magnetic anisotropy energy. So you see that the iron atoms closest to the magnesium oxide, so interfacing to the oxide, has by far the largest anisotropy energy. This is a well-known result. After that, in the center, we see oscillations, but rapidly decreasing to values around zero. So, um, we're now ready to, uh, to start the vampire calculations. But before that, we might ask ourselves if the structures obtained using the moment tensor potentials are actually accurate enough. And uh, let me just go back to, uh, to the presentation. So we actually, of course, tested this a lot. And uh, the result is that indeed the, re the structures obtained using moment tensor potentials are as good as those you would get if you relaxed with pure DFT. So here I show um, Curie temperatures calculated from directly from the Heisenberg exchange object within the mean field approximation. And I show them on a figure where on this axis I have the results obtained from the MCP relaxed structure and up here I have the same structures but relaxed with DFT. And it's obvious that we get more or less exactly the same results. The same is true over here, but here I now show the total magnetic anisotropy energy obtained from the study object. Again, we get the same values from MTP relaxed structures as with DFT relaxed structures. The different points here correspond to different uh, free layer thicknesses and also different cobalt concentrations in an iron cobalt random alloy. So indeed, the MTP provides very good structures for this, these systems. Now let's go back to setting up a vampire. The vampire scripter is also located on these supplementary tools down at the bottom. We can open this. And on the first place, in order to get started, we need a Heisenberg exchange object and potentially also a magnetic anisotropy. So I will simply drop those we just calculated on here. Next is to define the size and shape. I would like to model a cylinder with a diameter of 10 nanometers. In this case, I also need to increase the simulation cell. These values are taken directly from the unit cell used for the Heisenberg exchange. For this, I need to increase such that the cylinder can be within the cell. I can just put it to 12, for instance, 12. In the set direction, I'm actually satisfied with this value, since this is just the uh, length of the simulation cell in the set direction, which is fine enough. Next tab up here is to define the simulation type. Here you can choose among different simulations, either Curie temperature or hysteresis loop, field cooling, or in this case, constrained Monte Carlo. This is particularly useful for calculating um, magnetic anisotropies at finite temperatures. Here I will just uh, modify uh, some parameters. So up here I defined which temperatures we're considering. 
so I will decrease the number of points but otherwise leave uh, these data for the angles as they are so we are varying uh, a spin direction starting out pointing in the set direction and then rotating over in the uh, in the x direction and for the iteration parameters I will leave them as they are this is something that needs to be verified that you have enough uh, time steps for equilibration and, uh, and loop time steps. For more info, I would refer to the vampire manual. In the final tab, I can define my uh, file names and also which folder I would uh, store my results in. Uh, here I have by default the vampire folder. And I can now uh, write the uh, files and uh, let's just see what has been written here. So I have three files used for vampire, which is called input and materials file and a unit cell file. These define completely the vampire simulation. And uh, people familiar with Vampire, you can, uh, can have a look at it. So this is the uh, input file where we have the system information and uh, simulation information. If you like, you can of course add to this yourself if you need to modify or use uh, other Vampire commands, since we have not exposed all uh, the vampire options in this script. The materials file contains information about different materials in the calculation, and that includes both uh, the uh, materials of the element, oxide, magnesium, iron, but also different uh, anisotropy constants and uh, different atomic uh, spin moments. Finally, in the uh, unit cell file, we have defined all the ex exchange interactions from the Heisenberg exchange, which are, are written down here uh, in this uh, long file. So this is the direct input for Vampire, but we can also uh, run it through a Python script. And uh, let's have a look at uh, how this looks. So the Python script uh, loads in the uh, the Heisenberg exchange and magnetic anisotropy energy as we dropped. Then it sets up uh, a configuration parameters, which is the, the cylinder. Uh, with a diameter of uh, 10 nanometer. It uh, sets up the uh, constraint anisotropy simulation. Here's a, a function that writes the vampire file. So this would produce the input and input.mat and input.unit cell, cell file that we just saw. Then we execute vampire in a subprocess in Python. And finally, we read in the data. So this can be submitted either to a cluster or run locally. You should notice, however, that in our current implementation, we can only execute Vampire in serial. If you have a parallel installation, you can uh, copy the, the different input file to your directory and run it there. In that case, you would just need in the end to run uh, the final part here in order to read in the data. But for our case, we would uh, execute uh, Vampire uh, in a serial process, um, just uh, on, the, on the local computer. So uh, these vampire calculations, uh, depending on the size of the structure, can be uh, 
a matter of uh, of minutes, but it can also take uh, several hours. So, but let's just uh, see what happens when it starts. So here we are now actually executing Vampire inside uh, Quantum ATK, and then you would be able to monitor the progress as uh, as the program proceeds. After several hours, the vampire simulation has finished and we can now inspect the results. So if I focus on the vampire folder, there will be a, a lot of data, which is the direct uh, output uh, from vampire. Uh, but we can focus in on the, uh, the ATK objects. So by doing this, here I have two objects. One is the spin dynamics trajectory. This comes out for all our of the simulations. Here you can uh, monitor uh, snapshots of the spin dynamics uh, as the simulation proceeds. So uh, in this case, in the constraint and isotropy calculation, we uh, we run we increase the temperature. From, from 0 to 1500, then the uh, constraint angle is, is changed a little bit and we repeat the increasing temperatures. Over here we have the, the configuration, so we have this cylinder of uh, 10 nanometer in diameter, and we can, uh, we can also visualize the spin components. So initially it is uh, uh, oriented along the, the, the set direction, indicated by this purple color here. And then uh, as we start increasing uh, the temperature, it becomes more and more random and the magnetization drops from one to around uh, zero. So these are only snapshots uh, of a particular point in this uh, simulation. And then we start over uh, again from zero where it's more or less aligned to set. Then uh, going along this uh, trajectory, in the end, we have uh, constrained the magnetization to the uh, X direction. So here it's not, we should probably rather color along the X. And uh, then we see that uh, it, it, uh, it starts out being maximum in the X direction and then as the temperature increases, it gets randomized and magnetization length dropped to zero. The other analysis uh, object, which is more uh, quantitative, is the actual magnetic anisotropy object. It has uh, a number of different uh, tab windows over here. The first one we see is, uh, is the torque, which is the actual quantity being calculated during the constrained Monte Carlo simulation. So here we see the torque as function of the phi angle, and each curve represents a different temperature. When you integrate this torque, as explained in the reference papers from vampire developers, uh, you can get the free energy as a function of angle, and this you get in this way. So here we get free energy as function of phi angle, and the uh, the anisotropy energy is simply the maximum point here, where it's pointing in the x direction. This we can uh, then take the maximum point here and plot as function of temperature. This is shown here in the in this third tab where we have the anisotropy energy decreasing as function of temperature and at some point it essentially goes to zero. We can also plot the corresponding magnetization and this is similar to what you would get from a Curie temperature simulation. We see that the magnetization drops to zero around slightly above 1000 Kelvin as is expected for, for bulk iron. Finally, you can plot the magnetization versus the uh, anisotropy energy. But main result is probably uh, this, where we see that at room temperature, 
in this case the magnetization has dropped from the uh, initial zero Kelvin limit. This is what we, the result we will get directly from the magnetic and absorption energy study object that we saw previously. But due to the randomization of the spins, it drops to a much lower value, which is approximately uh, 0 0.7 EV in this case. Let us uh, finally analyze a little bit more on this result. So we got an, an isotropy energy of 0 0.729 EV for our 10 nanometer uh, cylinder. A room temperature that corresponds to a stability factor of around 28. However, for a 10 years retention, one typically requires at least a delta factor larger than 60. So that tells us that using this technology of iron directly coupled to MGO is probably not scalable uh, down to the 10 nanometer limit. In fact, if we approximate delta E to be proportional to the area, then we can get that the required diameter uh, of a cylinder for having a uh, delta larger than 60 would be around 15 nanometer. One should note, however, that in these simulations that we have performed, we did not include dipole interactions or demagnetization energy. So this result is slightly too large. Dipole interactions can be included in Vampire, and doing so, the delta E would decrease and leading to an increased minimum diameter uh, for having delta larger than 60. In this case, we estimated it to be 25 nanometer. So coming to the summary, in this tutorial, we have shown how to generate a magnetic tunnel junction for MRAM using the MRAM builder and using moment tensor potentials for optimization, which is very fast. We have obtained parameters for the spin Hamiltonian directly from GFT using Heisenberg exchange and magnetic and isotropy energy storage object. Those parameters were inputted directly to Vampire such that no mat additional materials parameters were used. By doing so, we have estimated that a minimal diameter required for having a stability factor larger than 60 is around 25 nanometer. A lot of further studies are possible. One could study if one could increase the anisotropy energy using strain, mix in cobalt to, such that you have an iron cobalt alloy. One can modify the free layer thickness, investigate the role of defects, or study the influence of having a tungsten or tensilum spacer layers, or many other possibilities. Thank you for watching.